It's April 1st. You guys have been patiently waiting a month, and it's now here. It is me, John Lorden. And me, Daniel Hallen. I was trying to think of some good April Fool's joke. Yeah. Oh, it didn't that's come to right. me. <laughs> I totally missed the opportunity. Yeah. I was trying to think so fast, and my brain just was like, girl, you should have thought about this way ahead of time. I tried, though. <laughs> I did. I was going to try to do something good for you guys. It just it didn't go well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And and it just occurred to me, too. Yeah, this is coming out on April Fool's Day. Um, I, I hope you have some fun with that. We could all use a little more fun right now. That's for sure. Yep. But oh, my goodness. Yeah. Thank you for spending your time with us here on Crime After Crime. Um, so I know there's a lot going on in the country. There's a lot going on around the world. We just want to tell you guys, thank you for spending some time with us. We're really happy to be here, maybe to give everyone a little bit of a breather. Um, we're going to talk about some very interesting cases today. And uh, let's get to it. Uh, but before we do that, of course, we need to do some voting results. Danielle, do you have a song at least for the voting results? I mean, it might be a sad one. A sad song? <laughs> I'm telling you what. I'm looking at the at the results right now. Yeah. I feel I feel like I'm starting to get really good at guessing who's going to win. Okay. And who's going to lose? I am. I'm being serious. So as you guys know, last month was criminal athletes. Honestly, one of my favorite topics I think we've ever done. I actually went on to continue looking up other unsuspecting types of crimes and yeah. criminals. It just, it really took me down the rabbit hole. I ended up doing something crazy on my channel regarding that. Um, but apparently <laughs> I didn't do as hot as I thought I did on my topic because on Twitter, John whooped my butt at 52% and I received 48% of the votes and I, I can see his face right now and he wants to say, Danielle, that's so close. It's so close. That's not a <laughs> whipping. That's that's like, that's like that's the best case scenario that I can think of is that both stories are so good. The audience, it came down to like a coin flip. But on YouTube, John had 61% and I had 38 so that means season total so far, I've won two, John has won four. You guys, this is real. He was not joking about the season of revenge. The and season I'm gonna have of to, revenge. I'm telling you, and but I will say, your criminal athlete you brought last time, that entire story, I'm pretty sure I told everybody I know at this point because I am just so wildly shocked about all the information I didn't know behind that picture. If you guys have not listened to that episode, now's a good time to go and do it because it was it was amazing. I thought it was a great one. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, you know, I heard from friends of mine at the at the gym back back when I was able to do that um, that uh, they actually loved your story. Yay! <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it went both ways, and I think the the numbers are showing that. Um, so what does that mean, Danielle? I've got the cup right here. <laughs> you do. You get to keep it. I get there to hand go. it to myself. Oh, excellent! Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I, guess I'll have to drink my, I guess I'll have to drink my coffee right from the pot now. That's right. That's right. I'm going to keep this. Yeah, actually, with what's going on nowadays, maybe it's best that I keep this mug, huh? I'm telling you what. I don't have any gloves. I'm not reaching across that screen. It's not happening. <laughs> I'll wipe it down before I put it in the mail. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I appreciate it. Yeah. And just to, to remind people that or to let people know that maybe weren't here for season one, um, it feels like we're following a trend that we've done before. It does. There was a little run on season yep. one where I took a little bit of a lead and then you came back with a vengeance. So is this going to be... It happened later on, though. We were like tit for tat for a long time. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we both had these runs. Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting nervous already. Well, I don't know. You know, it just... Can I close out the season of revenge? I guess that's the question at this point. <laughs> or is it going to be the season of failure? I don't know. We're going to find out. <laughs> Um, but of course, for today's episode, we are talking about craziest evidence. Now, crimes are solved in many different ways, but today we're looking for the most interesting, different, and just flat out craziest evidence that helped bring justice to a case. And as usual, we are going to start with Danielle's story. You ready? I sure am. Let's get to it. Now, DNA isn't something that is unheard of when it comes to solving a crime. Nowadays, it's probably one of the most heavily relied on, even though that's kind of something that a lot of people don't agree with. But we do often see human DNA 
as being the only option is DNA evidence. But the reality is that all living things have DNA. DNA is what makes us unique, just like our fingerprints, which is probably why authorities value it so highly. But in 1992, a very different kind of DNA was used to solve a murder in many ways, in a way many people didn't believe was even possible. Mm. It all started on, I know, I'm excited about the story. I am too. <laughs> it all started on May 3rd, 1992 in Maricopa County, Arizona, known for its winding and long roads through beautiful scenery. It's no surprise at all that this time of year, the roads and highways were flooded with motorcyclists. Most expected to see great views, eat great food along the way, but none of them expected to find a body on the side of the road. But one motorcyclist found just that. It was in a deserted area just outside of Phoenix. The motorcyclist saw something odd out of the corner of his eye. And once he pulled over, he realized he found the body of a woman who had been bound and very obviously strangled by her own clothing. Authorities were notified and they obviously rushed to the scene. They managed to find a few pieces of evidence. There was a paper or a pager that was tossed in the grass. The only reason they found it is because it was beeping obnoxiously. We all can hear it in our heads right now. I know it. Yeah. They found a syringe and clothing scattered around, and they hoped that one of these items would lead them to the identity of their victim and also the perpetrator. It appeared as if the woman may have been sexually assaulted, and aerial shots done by a photographer showed a matted down area of grass where the initial struggle likely occurred. Once a medical examiner completed an autopsy, the remains were found to belong to a 30-year-old woman named Denise Johnson. Strangulation ended up being the cause of death, but there had been no sexual assault, but she had been high on cocaine at the time of her death. Now, Denise herself was a single mother of two. She had a rough life. She was known for partying and drugs and hanging around all of the wrong crowds. And she earned most of her money through selling drugs and scamming people, wow. mainly truck drivers passing through at local truck stops. And unfortunately, we all, know what this, we all know what this means. The authorities had a difficult road ahead. This opened up a plethora of possibilities. Had she scammed the wrong person? Did she maybe owe someone money and they came after her? Or during a sale, did she bump into someone with bad intentions that had fled the area at this point? Authorities were chasing down every possible lead, every pathway of her life, but it was just so chaotic that there wasn't really a solid way to go. And the evidence didn't seem to mean a lot at this point. Every lead just went straight to a dead end, and so they decided to look at the only thing that seemed to have evidentiary value that didn't belong to Denise, the pager. After taking a deeper look into the pager, they found it belonged to a truck driver named Mark Bogan. Since this was the only person of interest at this point, Mark was brought in and he had a very interesting story to tell. Mark said that on the night of May 2nd, the day before Denise was found, he was on his way back home from work. At some point, he pulled over to make a quick phone call, and Denise approached him in hopes of getting a ride. She claimed to just need a ride to the interstate, but once in the car, she started making sexual advances. Somehow, and went from that point to stopping in the middle of nowhere to have consensual sex. But Mark said that after this, they headed her back to her destination, but then he said Denise turned on him. Mark stated, while saying goodbye to Denise, she tried to steal a few things off of the dash of his truck and run, but he caught her, managed to stag a few of his belongings back, belongings back before she took off on foot. So he claims there was some sort of altercation, but he was not the one who murdered her. Did he happen to say what the items were? I'm just curious what you keep on your dashboard that's so valuable. <sighs> He said his wallet. Okay. I think that was probably the only specific piece uh, that he was able to state. Okay. And that was the one thing he did manage to get back. Right. Now, the story, I mean, honestly, doesn't seem all that far-fetched. She did travel around a lot. She did sell a lot. She was around truck drivers a lot. If she had grabbed some of his belongings because she maybe wasn't making enough money, wanted to get a little bit more, she was also known for shorthanding truck drivers, mm. um, maybe the pager was actually one of the items that she grabbed. And this would be a way to explain why it was by her body. Mark even told authorities that he noticed his pager was missing the morning of the 3rd and had reported it to the pager company thinking he had just dropped it somewhere. They decided to take Mark's truck anyways to process it for evidence and nothing inside the vehicle even indicated that a crime had occurred or that Denise had even been in the car. They weren't able to find fingerprints, saliva, blood, no physical evidence at all. So this lead with Mark, the only thing they were holding on to seemed like another dead end. Yeah. 
But while all of this was seeming to add up his story, one huge part of his story was not adding up. Mark claimed to have stopped for consensual sex, but there was no sign of intercourse at all through the autopsy or in the truck where he claimed it occurred. So authorities are still keeping him on the radar just in case. Witnesses did come forward claiming to see Mark leaving the scene of the crime around 1.30 in the morning, and his wife also confirmed that he arrived home at around 2 a.m. But at this point, all of this is circumstantial, and for the most part, it kind of only proved his version of events. It just wasn't enough for authorities to move forward with the idea that Mark could be responsible. So authorities were back to square one. Can't imagine how frustrating that must feel. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. So the, the assigned detective, Charles Norton, decided to revisit the scene to look for anything they may have missed. Lining the area were a bunch of Palo Verde trees, Arizona's state tree to be specific. And upon further investigation, Charles, and he says it was almost by complete and total accident, he saw something that had not previously been noted. One of the trees had a lower branch that had a fresh cut along the surface, as if something had hit it. Okay. This was too much of a coincidence. So he felt this was absolutely evidence involved in this crime. The trees were very, very far off the road. It was a very remote area. Someone would not have ended up in that location close enough to the trees to damage them with a vehicle or something large, unless they went back there on purpose. And the last person back there was Denise and she had been killed. He decided to take pictures of the damage as well as a few bean pods from the tree, just in case they somehow could be used and it was all put into evidence. Again, he's not thinking too much of this. He's like, oh, this is odd. It definitely could be involved, but I'll probably get nothing from it. But once reviewing all evidence gathered in the case, they realized they hit an unexpected jackpot. While going through Mark's truck, while they didn't find any direct evidence thought to be related at all, they did find two bean pods from a Palo Verde tree. They didn't think of them. They didn't think of them when they were looking through it, but they had decided again to just take it just in case. Right. But at this point, authorities were piecing together what seemed to be a fabricated story. Mark claimed they had consensual sex, but there was no sign of that on Denise or in his vehicle. He claimed to have dropped her off right at the edge of the road, yet somehow a tree that had been hit, a Palo Verde tree that is far off the road, bean pods got into his truck. If all he said was true, you know, how did those bean pods get there? And authorities knew if they were going to link this at all, that was going to be the best way to do it. But the only way to prove this was seeing if the bean pods from Mark's truck matched the bean pods from the tree at the crime scene. It's the state tree. It's got to be everywhere. It exactly. Been, yeah, they could, <laughs> those pods could have come from any other number of trees. So, yeah, that's a really unique challenge. This is why authorities said it was going to be so difficult. There is a reason the Palo Verde tree is Arizona straight state tree. Yeah. It is one of the handful, like teeny tiny handful that can even grow in Arizona because of the heat and the sun. So they are everywhere. You look up any picture of Arizona, guaranteed you're going to see a Palo Verde tree. So the only way to establish if the bean pods from the car were the same as from the tree would be through plant DNA matching, which... Nobody was even sure it was possible because it had never been done before. Yeah, yeah. Who knows that it, it, it would be unique, you know? Mm -hmm. That is so, so strange. I'm telling you. And I'm just impressed that authorities had this thought process to begin with. So authorities decided to reach out to scientists and everyone they could across the United States, mainly to see, first of all, if this could even be done, and second of all, what it would take if it could be. And the responses were not very promising initially. Majority of people believed it was not possible, and others said that even if they could figure it out, the cost would be absolutely astronomical for this. Sure. But that is until they found help in their own backyard at the University of Arizona. They managed to wrangle in the help of a plant molecular geneticist named Dr. Timothy Helenjaris. He was very intrigued with the idea of plant DNA, specifically on the Palo Verde trees, since it's the state tree, so he got to work. Over months, he conducted several experiments, poured in, I believe, over $1,000 of his own money, and he was able to prove through his testing that each Palo Verde tree has its own DNA profile, just as each human being has their own DNA profile. Wow. He used a very interesting technique 
called randomly amplified polymorphic DNA, also known as RAPID. So he completely did something no one had ever done before. Yeah. Yeah. To, to keep things as safe as possible once all of this was found out and to make sure their first attempt worked to its potential, authorities collected and handed over 100 samples from Palo Verde trees across Arizona and for good measure gave the geneticist samples from the tree at the crime scene without telling him. So right. he had absolutely no idea. Dr. Helen Jarris came to them terrified and shocked one day when he realized a sample that he had been given matched pods taken from the crime scene. But this is exactly what they were hoping for. Yeah, he thought his theory was broke yeah. at that point because he's like, oh, it matched one of the other random trees. He panicked, but he had no idea. They ended up telling him, but he proved that it was possible to match tree DNA. <laughs> so th there was the April Fool's joke right there. They, they pulled in on this guy that was putting in his own money, taking on a challenge that no one else wanted. And the cops yep. thought, hey, we're going to we're going to just uh... <laughs> we're gonna pull one over on this guy. Exactly. <laughs> this was something that had never been done before. And not just obviously on the science side of things, but tree DNA because of that obviously had never been used as evidence in a court of law. So authorities knew this was going to be a very, very long shot, but definitely one worth going for because it was the only evidence they had and they had enough tests to prove it. I couldn't quite understand. I was trying to look at the different research he did, but he was able able to pinpoint, I think, even something out of like a lineup of like 18 different trees from all over the county and from like the line of trees right there. I don't know how he did it. It was hard to explain. So if someone ends up looking that up and looking deeper into it, I wish I was smart enough to understand it, but I wasn't. <laughs> uh, but he found, he found multiple different ways to prove his theory, basically. Yeah. Long story yeah. short. Um, but they decided to then test the pods found in Mark's car to the pods from the tree that was damaged, and it was a match. Mark was arrested and charged with the murder of Denise because of bean pods Crazy. from a tree. Crazy. Three days of arguments ensued between judges, lawyers, scientists over whether plant DNA could be used as valid evidence in a crime. Not only had it never been done before in the U.S., but it actually had never been done across the entire world. But every single scientist, no matter what kind, came forward and seemed to be on the exact same page. DNA is DNA. The geneticist was able to technically prove that plant DNA is distinct and unique just as human DNA is, and human DNA is allowed. So the trial moved forward with the plant DNA from the bean pods being the main piece of evidence to prove Mark was responsible. The prosecution came up with the likely scenario that unfolded that night. Authorities, and this is why this all worked out so well in my opinion, believe that majority of Mark's story really is what happened. Mm -hmm. However, things weren't as consensual as he made it out to seem, and they believe this is where things went wrong. After killing Denise, he likely tried to take her back to the trees to get rid of her off the side of the road and tried to leave the area in a panic. And that's when he likely hit the Palo Verde tree, causing the scratch on the tree and the bean pods inside the vehicle. Between graphic details of how Denise's body was found that I'm not going over, coupled with testimonies from people that had been in previous relationships with Mark, everything was adding up to support the evidence that the bean pods found, along with the evidence found through Denise's autopsy. Then the prosecution pulled out the bean pods, they presented the tree DNA, and everyone there was thrown through an absolute loop. The defense couldn't exactly argue with the science behind everything. They decided to argue a different way instead, and they claimed that authorities had absolutely, n had they had no way to solve this crime, that they basically were stuck. And without outside DNA, they were relying on circumstantial evidence. So sure. the defense claimed that authorities were disappointed when they found nothing connecting Mark, so they planted the pods in his car. And this caused a huge uproar, but even that desperate attempt failed immediately. The beans from Mark's truck had been collected prior to when Norton went out for the second look at the scene to collect the bean pods from the tree themselves. So there was absolutely no way this could have been done. Right, wow. Finally, in July of 1993, the jury ended up finding Mark guilty of first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison with possible parole in 25 years. He did attempt to appeal. I mean, if you're going to appeal, this is kind of the case to do it with when you've yeah. got new, you know, new science. Um, but the conviction and sentence were upheld. Authorities said that without being able to use the bean pods and the tree DNA from Mark's truck and evidence, the case never would have even made it to trial and Mark would be walking free. Wow. 
Absolutely insane. Bean pod tree DNA. (laughs) (laughs) Is there any explanation about what the, why he did this, what the MO was? So, I mean, it kind of ties into, from what I've seen, he was into bondage. Okay. And yeah, according to a lot of his ex-girlfriends, and he was very, very rough with it, and it wasn't like safe practices of bondage, and she likely panicked. Um, the state that her body was found in, they thought she was sexually assaulted because there were certain marks on her. Um, so that kind of tied in with the bondage, and they believe that you know he just got mad because she started to deny him, and yeah. he acted out against her because of that. Okay. okay. But they believe, but they believe the rest of the story went exactly as he said. And that's why he was able to, you know, come in so nonchalant and be like, hey, yeah, this is what happened. Because, you know, you it's like we always say you have to find the truth within the lies. There's usually truth within it. Right. And they do believe she was in fact picked up. That matches what her lifestyle was like. And um the timelines were matching up, but things just went wrong. Wow. Almost got away with it. I love that there's this angle of Yes, they're using DNA, but they're kind of combining that with just old school. Like, that sounds like something you'd hear in like a Sherlock Holmes novel or something. Like, yep. oh, look, the bean pods, Watson. <laughs> These are the same. Exactly. Yeah, you know. <laughs> exactly. I'm it just telling seems so you. fictional. Well, if, I mean, sit and think about it. I feel like we all kind of see evidence as being very specific things. We hear about the same types of evidence being found over and over. And yeah. that's why it's so fascinating to me the way these forensic examinations are held. And, you know, when they do forensics on a vehicle or something like that, they get things down to like the tiniest fiber. And it's for reasons like this. You just never know. Like if I was new to the job and had been thrown in that, I would have looked at that and been like, wow, they like they tracked stuff in on their shoe one of the times they were in their car. And I never would have thought to take it. Right. right. I'd be fired right off the bat. But um, well, especially without the science there to back it, you know, it's like you might look at an item like that and say, oh, okay, well, yeah, I've never heard of a crime being solved with with anything related to that before. So that's not going to come into play here. But I think that's what's, you know, especially being a good forensic investigator like that, Mm -hmm. I think you have to be open to just, I need to note, like using a scientific method, I need to note the condition of everything that's going on here, save all samples that I can. Um, And obviously it paid out. And then on top Mm -hmm. of that, I I think a real hero is, I can't remember his last name, but Dr. Tim in this. I mean, to take on a challenge like that. and He sure did. I think that's something cool about the scientific community, uh, that it doesn't always necessarily get motivated by large amounts of money or, you know, fame or stuff like that. Sometimes it's just a matter of putting a challenge in someone's hands. Exactly. And trying to do something that seems impossible. Because I think that's, you know, I, I think that was awesome because they, I mean, they went all over the United States speaking to different scientists and they were saying 90% of them were like, nope, that's not possible. Yeah. Can't do that. Like, wouldn't even try, wouldn't even think about it. And I mean, I know that the test that he had was very, very different, obviously, than the test used on human DNA, but I'm sure it kind of follows, it has to follow somewhat closely to that, you would think. You would think so. You think at some point they're dealing with the same, I mean, it winds up being the same type of information. So there has to be some of the processes that you could borrow from. Other exactly. samples. Yeah. Like even in biology, I've extracted DNA from a strawberry, you know? So, I mean, I feel like, right. I don't know, but I'm, I'm very happy that he did that as well because, I mean, think about it. Yeah. There's no telling at this point what other things can be solved because he's like, you know what? <laughs> Tree DNA. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Christy Arnhart, my co-producer on the Lord and Arts channel, uh, you know, she researches and writes a lot of uh, pretty much all the episodes of Case Cracked nowadays. And uh, she just sent me a script. I actually just recorded it, and it's going to be released by the time you guys are hearing this. Uh, We named the episode Detective Tinker, the cat. Oh, my gosh. Uh, And essentially, it is kind of along these same lines. Mm -hmm. It's about a cat DNA database that is created to help solve a crime because they find cat hair on an item that's found with part of a body. Oh, I feel like I, I think I came across that while researching for this episode. It's a really, really good story. And it just goes to show that, um, yeah, the DNA frontiers, I think we're still cracking into them. I mean, of course, mm-hmm. we have the genealogy thing that's very hot and and was a huge revolution in it right now uh, coming into play. But 
you've got all these other interesting aspects of, yeah. you know, I mean, take any piece of my clothing, you're absolutely going to find a, a cat hair fiber from mm -hmm. one of my four cats on it. Absolutely. I bet take some of your clothing, a, a piece of Honda is somewhere on your yep. clothing as well. So if there is some way to tie that back, and in these cases, you know, these cases are a little interesting because they kind of know who they have to look at, in, yeah. in at least in these cat cases. Uh, there's a different story from a woman in Canada in, I think it was around 93, um, where a leather jacket was left with her body and the leather jacket had her blood all over it. So obviously it probably belonged to the guy that attacked her. Yeah. And in the pocket of the leather jacket was cat hair. And it tied back to her ex-husband, if I recall correctly. Oh my goodness. But in that case, they still have to know like, okay, this is one of our suspects. Oh, this guy has a cat. That cat's name was Snowball, by the way. Oh um, let's go get Snowball's hair and let's do a, a comparison and see if we can match that up. But yeah, yeah, it's very. Well, I mean, I mean, think about it. How many people walk around and they have pets at home? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Like, it, if that could be fully dealt with and cracked, the amount of people that can be caught, <laughs> yeah, is insane. Yeah, it's really about collecting the samples to make that database mm -hmm. worthwhile and then to make it pay off for cases where maybe you don't know the suspect and then how do you tie it back to that particular animal yep um but yeah plant pods cats <laughs> interesting <laughs> it's interesting. wild yeah i know i was so excited that it had never been done before yeah yeah um i'm really happy you chose that case i actually knew a little bit about that case mm -hmm. i had seen it before on one of those you know investigative discovery shows or something yeah. uh, but like years and years ago but when we first started talking about this episode that's the first case that popped in my mind i was like oh <laughs> the plant pod case i wonder if i should drop that one on her but i opted not to and you wound <laughs> Thank up thinking goodness because it was my favorite. I had a whole list of crazy ones, but a lot yeah. of them were way too dark for me to dive into. Yeah, um, yeah. So. There's some dark stuff. And some of them are too brief also. It's, it's another typical thing that we yeah. hit when we're researching this show. Mm -hmm. uh, in a very interesting way, mine, I, I don't know how we do this, Danielle. I, it's like we share a brain sometimes. My case, also somewhat related to an interesting item being found on a vehicle. I'm telling you. I know, but, but we don't talk. How does this happen? <laughs> I don't know, but I will say when I was looking up a lot of these cases, they were all kind of along these lines. Yeah. There were quite a few actually where some sort of, you know, something was found on a car, plant matter, just like something dirt, a specific type of dirt was found that's only in one location. Right. Um, so I don't know, maybe that's just kind of like the strange thing that's starting to be up and coming. And so that's what we're seeing the most with this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Although we've got some other very interesting ones for the extra stories that we're going to drop on mm -hmm. you guys too. Stay tuned for that. Right now, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. I've been using HelloFresh for months and cooking at home has never been so easy, fun, and delicious. HelloFresh delivers a box right to my door with step-by-step -step recipes and pre-measured ingredients, everything I need to pull together a delicious meal in about 30 minutes. They even have quick recipe options if you're looking to have dinner ready in just 20 minutes. I'm not a great cook, Danielle, but I gotta tell you, with HelloFresh, I'm getting there. I've made healthy farro bowls and even a tasty risotto. By far, these are the best dishes I've ever made. Just ask my wife. We had a delicious Gouda pork burger, and it was also great knowing that they kept my allergies in mind and out of my meals. HelloFresh also uses packaging that is almost entirely made from recyclable and or already recycled content. According to a university study, their carbon footprint is 25% lower than store-bought grocery-made meals. HelloFresh wants to make your life easier. You can easily change your delivery days, food preferences, and even skip a week whenever you need. You can also add extra meals or lunches to your order, or toss in some tasty sides like garlic bread and cookie dough. HelloFresh is now from $5.66 per serving. And HelloFresh has an amazing offer for our listeners. Go to HelloFresh.com forward slash crime after crime 10 and use code crime after crime 10 for 10 free meals, including free shipping. 
You heard that right. Go to HelloFresh.com forward slash Crime After Crime 10 right now and use code Crime After Crime 10 and you'll get 10 free meals, including free shipping. Don't miss out. Try HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit today. Welcome back, you guys, and please make sure to support these amazing companies that believe in crime after crime. I've said it once, I've said it a million times, I'm going to continue saying it. I love HelloFresh. I'm going to make salmon right after this episode <laughs> from HelloFresh, so I'm telling you, I'm a big fan. Awesome. Send me a picture of it. I'll, I'll sure include will. it in the in the ad. <laughs> <laughs> I sure will. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. I love HelloFresh, too. And just to let you guys know, HelloFresh has picked up multiple commercials for this season. We are so proud to be helping uh, raise awareness about their product, but also to get their support for Crime After Crime. Mm -hmm. So if you're a big fan of this show, try them. I, I seriously, you can't go wrong. You will absolutely love their service. All right, John. I told my story and I'm so excited to hear yours. All right. Well, let's see. Um, I know we've got at least one big similarity. We're going to talk about a vehicle in here somewhere. I'm talking about a man named Vincent Brothers. Now, Vincent Brothers may have had a good education and solid career tra tra trajectory, if I can get that word out, <laughs> but his love life, ooh, that was a very different story. Born uh -huh. May 31st, 1962, Vincent earned a bachelor's degree from Norfolk State University and got his master's in education at California State University in Bakersfield, California. His teaching career would also take off in Bakersfield, starting as a substitute teacher in 1987 and working his way up to vice principal of John C. Fremont Elementary School by 1995. Vincent was considered by many to be a respected community leader mentor, and Christian family man. When it came to that love life, though, whew, he would be married four times. Oh, boy. Twice to the same woman. Oh, whoa. <laughs> uh, jailed for spousal abuse, skip out on the birth of two of his children, accused of infidelity on numerous occasions. He actually admitted to some of it. Uh, and also accused of sexual harassment of an employee. So... When his estranged wife, Joni Harper, her mother, Ernestine Harper, and his three children, Marquise, Marshall, and Lindsay, were found brutally killed in July of 2003, of course, investigators cast an eye in his direction. Vincent had moved out of the home only a few months prior, but was still around to see his children and help with things around the house. When it came to July 6, 2003, the day of the murder, Vincent reportedly wasn't in California. Mm -hmm. He had flown over 2,000 miles away a few days before, splitting his time between visiting different family members in Ohio and North Carolina. He, I don't know how I feel about being a North Carolinian right now. I was going to say, <laughs> Vincent didn't stop by, did he? <laughs> oh, geez. He sounds like a scary fella. Are you, are you the alibi, Daniel? <laughs> Um, Surprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, he's not even in California, so of course he didn't do this. Um, there were no signs of forced entry, no murder weapons left behind, and nothing of value seemed to be missing from the house. Vincent Brothers' DNA was found there, but investigators couldn't say that it shouldn't be there because he had lived in the home previously. They tracked him down at his mother's home in North Carolina and told him the news. Vincent seemed devastated initially. However... Mm. He didn't show up to the memorial service. He did come to the funeral. When police later asked for help from Vincent, they found that he wasn't quite the devastated father they had spoken to before. He was now being uncooperative and didn't seem interested in helping or even learning more about what was going on in the investigation. Investigators found an interesting clue. The car he rented in Ohio, a Dodge Neon from Dollar Rent-A-Car, had racked up over 5,400 miles since Vincent acquired it. Over how, what period of time? This is all over about the course. I think he probably had the car for about a week. Okay. That's what I was guessing. <laughs> so that's a lot of I miles. Thought, I thought I'd drive a lot. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and ju- just doing some simple math, uh, we know that he was about 2,000 miles 2, away. 2,000 plus 2,000. Hmm. Maybe I should get Raylan in here. She's learning um, addition right now. Yeah, <laughs> sure she yeah, can help maybe, us with this. <laughs> maybe Raylan can help us solve this case. Um, obviously, that many miles would be enough to get him to California and back. Now, mm-hmm. Vincent claimed that he never left the eastern U.S. and he had numerous ways to prove it. He had receipts showing that he was in the Columbus, Ohio area specifically on the day of the murders and said he was involved in a minor accident when a young boy on a bike darted out into the street and struck a car that Vincent was in. Investigators seized the rental car, which had been washed by the company. You know, the rental company gets it back and they put it through a wash. It's just what they do. Um, They also reviewed his cell phone records. His cell phone did show that he was in Ohio on the day of the murders. And interestingly, it receives a call from the Harper home on that same day. Hmm. Despite the alibi, the case got national attention from the media and Vincent Brothers became an instant celebrity in Bakersfield. The school district pulled him out of day-to-day operations at the elementary school and had him working in the main office. It took the Bakersfield Police Department with the help of the FBI, the district attorney's crime lab, and police agencies in two other cities almost a year to put together a case against him. Wow. Brothers was arrested at his home in April of 2004. He had previously sold one of his vehicles and placed his house up for sale. So I'm thinking investigators were worried that he was getting Mm -hmm. ready to bolt. Yeah. Um, The trial would be delayed several times, but finally started in February of 2007 and lasted for three months. The prosecution was presenting a case based on greed that brothers wanted to rid himself of the financial obligations of his estranged wife and their children. During the proceedings, brothers sent a letter to a local paper saying, I have truly forgiven the one or ones who did this to me and my family. Oh boy. Isn't, isn't he a nice guy? Oh, he's, oh man. <laughs> I, you know, I almost wanted to just paste the whole letter in here. There's just so many things about the letter where you're like, what you're is just this? Sh- Shaking yeah. your head and rolling your eyes back as far as you possibly I mean, can. Serious, it's like, dude, you're 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 in a trial for the murder of your whole family, and, and you're, you're like, but I f- I forgive whoever did it though. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and writing a bunch of other stuff too, and then sending that off to a newspaper. I mean, just who's who does any of this? I don't. His lawyers definitely did not say, "Hey, Vincent, why don't you write a letter and send it to the newspaper?" Oh my gosh. Jurors reviewed over 1,100 evidence exhibits and heard testimony from 137 witnesses, including, guess what? He can't keep shut. You're lying. (laughs) No. Brothers himself decided to take the stand. (laughs) However, it was one key piece of evidence that solved a big question in this case. The question of, did he really drive all that way to California, was answered by bug guts. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> Bug guts, Danielle. <laughs> I'm telling you, this stuff is mind-blowing to me. Yeah, we need to start the Bug Guts DNA database. Exactly. Um, not quite <laughs> DNA in this case. Uh, the radiator and air filter was taken from the car to the Bohart Museum of Entomology for testing. Professor Lynn Kimsey from UC Davis took on the challenge of seeing if she could determine where he had been based on the bug parts that were smashed onto the radiator. Even though the car had been washed, the radiator left her plenty of evidence to review. Mm -hmm. In the United States, there are close to 200,000 known species of insects. She collected every bug bug part she could find, stating that she was surprised at how many intact specimens there were. Professor Kimsey found pieces of about 100 different types of insects on the radiator and a few in the air filter. Most were houseflies, which are found across the US, and mm-hmm. honeybees, which are one of the widest found insects in the world. So those weren't very helpful. But she found part of a grasshopper, a grasshopper with bright red legs. The red shanked grasshopper is not native to Ohio and is usually found in Western regions like Texas and Oklahoma. She found three more insects that shifted it even further west, and then two others called true bugs. These bugs can be found in California, but not exclusively. 
the investigators were asking for her to prove that this car was in California. So Professor Kimsey kept working with the radiator and found the proof that they were all looking for. The paper wasp is found only in the extreme southwest of the country, with a large concentration specifically in California. She also concluded that most of the driving was done at night. Since How she was on earth? Oh, bugs that probably only come out at night. Exactly. She was <laughs> finding... Good job, Danielle. <laughs> yeah, you nailed it. That's fascinating. Uh, I yeah. love entomology. Keep she going. was finding <laughs> moths on the radiator. My biggest fear. Mm -hmm. Which are flying around at night. And of course, they're attracted to the headlights. So you're going to find a lot of moths. But she didn't find any butterflies which fly around during the day. She, uh, her analysis even went as far as detailing two routes that the car must have taken to oh, California. That's wild. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Uh, Professor Kimsey would wind up taking the stand and testifying with her results. But what about, we have store receipts from Ohio. It was clearly Vincent's card, and it was from the same day of the murders. So investigators went and they pulled footage from the CCTV cameras of those stores and found that it wasn't Vincent using the card. It was his brother, Melvin. When Melvin was confronted, he initially lied, but later admitted to it, saying Vincent urged him to do it. As for the accident with the young boy on the bike, apparently his other brother, Troy, was the one that that happened to. Troy ignored a subpoena to testify and had an arrest warrant filed. He was eventually brought in and testified that it was indeed him that the accident happened with the young man. Did the brothers know what he was doing while they were kind so. of covering for him? Or do you think it was just like, a, hey, I really, really need you to do this? Well, there, I think there's two possibilities there. You've got a guy that is used to cheating on his women. I mean, it's it's kind of all over his past. So yeah. it could be that he was telling his brothers, like maybe they didn't know that he had separated from his wife at that point. Mm -hmm. And he was like, hey, I got to go meet up with my lady over here. Can you do this for me? And this way I'll have proof, you know, that I was actually there on that day or, yep. you know, things like that. And then maybe he hears the story about the kid on the bike hitting his brother's car and is just and like, hey. That. Perfect timing. <laughs> yeah. Hey, let me, uh, that happened to me. Okay. Just remember that. <laughs> Good job so, hitting that kid. I can use that. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. So, but the, the truth is, even if he's telling his brothers that he's doing that because he wants to go have an affair with someone, ultimately from his point of view, it's planning. I mean, he's yeah. planning this. Mm -hmm. um, so, and so yeah. cover for him for a while. Yeah. 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 And, you know, maybe that's just the type of relationship they had as brothers. Yeah. I, I don't know. On top of all that, remember, we've got the cell phone that's showing mm -hmm. that he was in Ohio. In Ohio. Uh, Vincent had actually left his phone behind and instructed his brother that was keeping that phone to make regular calls from it. Um, I didn't find anything else about this call specifically from the home back to the cell phone. I don't know if that was some kind of heads up about something or him just checking in with his brother, making sure he was using the phone. Um, but yeah, so he had his brother using the phone. The prosecuting district attorney, Lisa Green, stated that brothers lied at least 41 times while on the stand. Mm. On top of that, while changing from his jail uniform into a business suit for his court appearance, you're going to love this. He apparently attached both of his leg restraints to the same leg, rendering them ineffective. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. This guy's a trip. You Seriously. find the good ones. <laughs> I mean, he, does he think he's being a magician? What is he doing? He put oh, that's both. That's hilarious. Yeah. How do you put him? I, I would imagine what he tried to do maybe was wrap the chain around his other ankle and then yeah. attach the cuff to the same leg so that he could slip his foot out through the chain. But uh, yeah, they obviously caught him. Uh, oh my that, goodness. But that wasn't all, Danielle. He was also found to have three makeshift handcuff keys hidden in his hair according to a Kern County Sheriff's Office spokesman. He must just have like an adrenaline problem or like, you know what I'm saying? I'm being so serious. It's almost like he loves this thrill and he's like, how crazy right. can I make this? Yeah, because even what's that about? He's going to put a handcuff key in his hair and then what? In the middle of court, he's going just to- Just start like wildly shaking. <laughs> yeah, shake it out of his hair. <laughs> Pick it up somehow, undo his cuffs, and then what? Run out of the courtroom? In the middle of a courtroom? Yeah. They don't They don't have armed bailiffs or anything. Oh, wait. They actually do. Like, how does that work? I just... It's like, 
it's like he kind of thinks things through, but like yeah. he never quite never quite gets there. He thinks his ideas are so great, but he doesn't think of how realistic they actually are. Well, he was, I mean, come on, he was a vice principal, a vice principal of an elementary school, Danielle. I uh, <laughs> obviously a well-educated man. Uh -huh. um, the Bakersfield Californian ran an article stating that when brothers took the stand, he spent too much time talking about his own sexual appetite and smirking. Oh <laughs> we didn't have a relationship, brothers said, of one casual girlfriend. We just had sex, no agreements. We call each other, and if we feel like having sex, we have sex. <laughs> I'm sure everyone in that entire courtroom was just like, could you just please? <laughs> Can you imagine being his anymore. attorney? Yeah. Can you imagine? Oh, I would have walked out. Seriously. I would have been like, forget it. Talk about face palming <laughs> and shaking your head and rolling your eyes. I'm sure those guys, yeah, uh -huh. all of the above. Uh, when asked about the day of his wedding, the day that a lot of people would refer to as their happiest, he responded, well, actually, the night before was the happiest day. When asked why he replied that, he said, we had sex. <laughs> it was fun that night. We had uh, food. <laughs> <laughs> and then he smirked. A simple man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I guess from that, we can infer that he didn't have sex on his wedding night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't even thought about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the only thing that makes sense, right? Why is he going to say, I know. well, the night before was better because we had sex and food. Yeah, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, it took only uh, six hours of deliberation by the jury. Brothers was found guilty on all five counts of first degree murder and sentenced to death. It's reported he showed little emotion at his sentencing. He's currently on death row in California's San Quentin State Prison facility. When sentencing was handed down, his daughter from a different relationship, Margaret Kern Brothers, made a powerful statement. I'm leaving my name with him. I don't have a father now. He is just a man handcuffed to a chair looking straight ahead. He will never see me again until it's time to die. Ooh. Yeah. So All right, girl. He lost uh, another yeah. child in that. But um, I the think. The sad thing is, he, yeah, probably didn't care. Honestly, I mean, look what he did to his other kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, it's, it's a terrible way to look at it. But I'm happy that from Margaret's point of view, that she is disassociating from that and not expecting him to, you know, really be a father to her because of obviously what he did to her half siblings. Yeah. Um, a big thank you to the LA Times, Bakersfield.com, the Bakersfield Californian, the Smithsonian Channel, who did an excellent um, series on it. I can't remember what the name of the show is, but they had a really good show on this case. Uh, mm -hmm. Murderpedia and Wikipedia for information contributing to today's story. Now, and I had... I forgot, I forgot mine again. So a yeah. huge thank you specifically to Himraj Singh from Lawyers Update. He did an amazing article on my case, as well as Wikipedia and Murderpedia. Awesome. Did you run into the, the episode that I saw about your case? I think it was like uh, Forensic Files, maybe? I don't think so. Okay. If, I don't think I did. If I find it, I'm going to have to send it your way. Okay. Um, I had some questions coming out of this because one of the big things is, yeah, it's super cool to think about, you know, the bugs being the identifying thing about him traveling that way. But how do we know it was question, him? Thank you. That was my question this whole time. All yeah. I've been thinking is this is a rental car. It's been all over. Yeah, it's a rental and you, car. And you can't tell me him having it for a week that he was the one who had all those bugs going to the radiator. Other people. Right. I'm so happy you had the same question because this entire time it's been bugging the living tar out of me. Yeah. Well, there is an answer. There is? Uh, Thank uh, goodness. I wouldn't be yeah. able to sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> the rental car had been put into service. So it was literally a brand new car. Only, uh, I think there was only four total rentals by the time they took it into possession. So What are the chances? Yeah. And he was the last. So there was only three rentals that had happened before that. Investigators reached out to all those people, found out where the car had traveled, and it was all on the East Coast. No one had, head, had headed west in the car at all. So, And do you know what's so crazy to me about both of our stories? What? It's not just that the evidence is so strange. It's like... Bare, like by the most random circumstances possible. Yeah. Did this happen to line up? 
Yeah. And then it's like you had to take it a step further because it's very bizarre evidence that was found. Yeah. And bizarre how it got there and bizarre how it even worked out. Well, and we have the same mechanisms of a good investigator Mm because you had an investigator that was looking at this and the car had been washed by the time he saw it. And he's the one that noticed, hey, you know, the radiator has all these bugs on it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that could tell us where this car had been. So Um, many people wouldn't even think of that. Right. And then you've also got, once again, an academic. We've got a professor here that steps up and says, you know, this kind of thing hasn't been done before. Let's see if we can do it. And let's see if we can figure this out. Um, So, yeah, it had kind of similar components to yours. You have good investigator, great evidence collection, and then someone in the science field that's willing to take on a new challenge. Um, oh my the, goodness. The first time that bugs were used to uh, be detectives, essentially, was in 1935 in Scotland, where maggots were first used to determine the time of death. And back then, they got it down to about within a day that they could determine the mm-hmm. time of death. Uh, nowadays, our analysis can bring us to a matter of just a few hours in terms yep. of time of death. And it's even possible to extract victims' DNA from certain insects. I was wondering about that. Like things like mosquitoes and stuff like that. Like, it's crazy to me. I'm telling you, I've always been so fascinated by entomology ever since I used to watch Bones all the time. Oh, yeah. And I can't remember the guy's name with the curly hair. And he did a lot of entomology and then also worked with like dirt and random things like that. And I've always found that so wildly fascinating the information that can be found it's so it's so strange because like if you think about a mosquito or something like that how do you apply it in most cases it just it would never be possible or you know you can't really track the mosquito's path and think about all the different people the mosquito jumps on but um for very specific instances with specific cases and that's what we're talking about here today with both of our cases it's like that sliver of science nails this case exactly where it needs it It's insane. My mind is blown by this episode. This might be one of my favorite episodes we've ever done. Well, that's good. You've said that like two episodes in a a row now. I'll take that. I'm telling you, I'm having a great time. (laughs) (laughs) I'm having a great time on this podcast. Yeah. Um, Yeah, but that's absolutely crazy to me how it all just perfectly lined up. He's a mess. Yes. He is something else. And And it's a shame because there was people just left in in his wake. I mean, he was already, you know, a heartbreaker and, you know, we see violence violent tendencies in his past and it seems like that stuff is ramping up um you know i didn't really go into the details but these are terrible terrible crimes that happen yeah. against his family his uh mother-in-law and then of course his wife i mean you know a whole family completely wiped out they earlier that day they were at church oh my goodness you know they, they went out to lunch at black angus together they were expecting to go back to church that night yeah. I mean, the you know, it just it breaks your heart when you really get into the details on a case like that. Well, and it's scary, too, because he did plan things out to a certain extent as well. And his oh, yeah. brothers seemed to be covering him for a while. So had they not found this other evidence to nail him, there's no telling if they would have actually been able to right. get this fully solved. DNA wouldn't have necessarily helped in this case because exactly. it was in his home, unless it was DNA tied specifically to like a murder weapon or something like that, which they mm-hmm. didn't have. So... The only thing that they did find, there was a piece of a glove that they did Mm -hmm. find that had his DNA on it, but he was known to do handiwork around the house. So even that wouldn't really tie. Um, So yeah, there was was another interesting twist where a former student of his said that he saw Vincent around the house that week when Vincent was supposedly in Ohio and Vincent just comes out nailing this kid about, Oh, he's, you know, he didn't like me and he's drinking beers and he suffered some type of head wound. And Um, it's like, he can pull all these things out of his pocket. Like it's nothing. He he's really like, oh, yeah, I've got an explanation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the sense you get from this guy is just he's got an explanation for everything. But mm-hmm. when you really listen to what he's saying, in, in some of his arguments, he actually takes his own case apart, which is something else that it seems like his his lawyers were struggling with. So those poor poor lawyers. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, interesting, Danielle. Two very interesting cases, mm-hmm. but that's not all. We've got a few more. Um, Just quick stories for you. This one I'm calling Exhibit A. And the interesting evidence, a dream. In 1987, yeah. Can a dream be used as evidence, Danielle? 
Well, looks like it was. A woman in 1987 said she was sexually assaulted and that her attacker's face came to her in a dream. Obviously, she couldn't remember it, but she had a dream and Mm -hmm. all of a sudden remembered what he looked like. The man that she remembered was a neighbor of hers, and she had previously feuded with him. His name was Clarence Moses L. Clarence claimed that he was innocent. He was tried and convicted. Apparently, the dream actually played a big part into the testimony in this case as well. He was sentenced to 48 years in prison. He tried to appeal, but apparently the police department destroyed the DNA evidence from the crime scene. Years later, another inmate admitted to the attack in a letter to Clarence, but when questioned, he directly uh, recanted his confession. There was enough to get, that was apparently enough to get Moses a new trial. So after 28 years in prison, Moses is now a free man. He's also getting $2 million in restitution for the false conviction. Unfortunately, the statute of limitations has run out to charge the man who likely committed the crime, who had tons of previous sexual offenses. And his story is, oh, we actually had sex that night and things got a little rough and I punched her. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. A dream? A dream. Fascinating. Well... I have one as well, and this one's interesting. Okay, exhibit B. If you're on YouTube, you might find this one a little funny, given the thumbnail. Right. In 1991 in Salt Lake City, a 78-year-old Lucille Johnson was murdered in her home. Authorities were absolutely puzzled, seeing as she had no enemies, I'm pretty sure she lived there alone, and there seemed to be no evidence left behind whatsoever. 23 years later... Authorities decided to take a fresh look at the case and noticed that a handful of Legos had been collected as possible evidence. Police had found the Legos in the entry of her living room and the driveway, but originally didn't really think that much of them. Fingerprints ended up being found on the tiny Legos, and they just so happened to be a match to the son of a 47-year-old man named John Sansing, who was already in prison for another unrelated murder. But they had DNA that was found underneath, I think, Lucille's nails. And now that they had someone potentially connected, thanks to the Legos, they tested and it was a match. The man had brought his son potentially, and they don't know for sure because I don't think he ever would answer questions. But what authorities believe is that this man used his son to get into the home of this woman and then sat him down with Legos in the living room while he murdered her and then in a panic grabbed his son and left obviously leaving legos behind oh my goodness wow that is crazy a lego did you happen to know how they tracked it to the sun so i couldn't find too much on the story i know that they had like potential dna i think but they just weren't sure who to match it to i don't know if the son had been incarcerated if the father was in jail for a second murder not saying Children always go down the same path, but maybe it was crime that was just running in the family. Maybe his fingers were already processed somewhere. Could have been a safety kit, like processing or something. Yeah, Yeah. but it it, I couldn't find anywhere how, but they managed to track uh, it to the son, and then they were able to then match the DNA to the father. Wash your Legos. Yep. (laughs) All right. Well, exhibit C, our last one for the day. Um, Danielle, did you know that crimes can be solved using... Rihanna's social media. Oh boy. Buckle up. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> 2013, Rihanna was in Thailand during her diamonds tour and found some guys offering a tourist photo opportunity with what looked like an adorable bug eyed raccoon. She snapped a selfie and posted it to her Instagram with the caption, Look who's talking dirty to me. <laughs> the animal was actually a slow loris which are apparently a protected species in Thailand. Authorities were alerted to the picture of Rihanna and police arrested the two individuals who brought out the slow loris as a photo opportunity for tourists. The men could face up to four years in prison. (laughs) I mean, you had, okay, they have to know who Rihanna was and they had to have known they were doing something illegal. Well, Why now, you... I mean, it wasn't like she was dressed up like she was just off stage or something. I mean, you know, she's wearing casual clothes and she's got sunglasses on. And Oh, man. Talk about like 
perfect series of events there to screw yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, guess what, Danielle? That wasn't all. Um, Rihanna continued her trip and she visited a sex show. Oh, no. And she posted to social media about it. Either I was wasted last night or I saw a Thai woman pull a live bird, two turtles, <gasps> razors, shoot darts, and ping pong all out of her blank. You are lying right now. <laughs> nope. no, nope, I'm not. Uh, she wrote that in a message on September 20th to her more than 32 million followers on Twitter. The bar owner was cited and charged. The local district chief stated it was the result of the visit by Rihanna. The authorities will be more strict towards inappropriate shows or wildlife attractions. <laughs> Rihanna's just single-handedly taking down criminals without yeah, even don't knowing be a, it. Don't be a criminal in Thailand when <laughs> Rihanna's around with her cell phone. Like, the chances of one is insane, but the fact that two, two different crimes out of that. Uh-huh, on the and same this, trip. Man, that second one was bizarre, too. Yes. If I, I would have thought I had been drugged. <laughs> Seriously. I'd be like, who gave me what? Because <laughs> yeah. this isn't normal. Yep. Oh, my goodness. Some crazy ones, guys. Crazy. But this brings us to who's going to win this month. And keep in mind, I'm too behind right now. <laughs> <laughs> She's making an appeal just to saying, the audience. <laughs> I'm just I'm just reminding them. Um, but you guys get to vote on who had the best craziest evidence story. That's right. And for the first seven days after the episode drops, you can vote on our Twitter account at CrimeAfterPod or... You guys can also vote on YouTube. Just kind of hover your mouse over the video or put your finger on the video at any time. A little eye will pop up. Click the eye, cast your vote, and we'll see what the totals end up being next month. Uh, you know, I vote for Rihanna. I know. I do, too. <laughs> can <laughs> Rihanna, we make her an option? <laughs> Rihanna, the crime fighter. Uh, please join us again on May 1st when we're back with our next episode in honor of how much we love HelloFresh. I'm just going to come out and say it. <laughs> We're Which going, is pretty serious. Yeah, this is this is a serious relationship we have going on with HelloFresh. <laughs> uh, we are doing the episode Felony Foodsters. This is going to be interesting. Food-related crimes or people that are driven by food motives. There's all kinds of different ways this can go. <laughs> people driven by food motives. I don't know why. That's hilarious. <laughs> That's hilarious. The porch pirates that are taking Danielle's HelloFresh. <laughs> Oh, look, I would find someone immediately. <laughs> and, send, and send Rihanna after them. Exactly. If you loved this and you want to find more of John and I, first of all, if you're on the podcast version of this, I want to remind you, we do have a YouTube version, video version. Mm -hmm. But we also each have our own YouTube channels. You can search Daniel Hallen or John Lorden or Brain Scratch for him. And we both have social media. I usually am only on Instagram. I will say that. And again, just look up Daniel Hallen. Yep. You can find me on Twitter at Lorden Arts. If you have ideas you'd like to submit, please email us at crimeaftercrime at lordenarts.com. Or you can also tweet them to us at crimeafterpod. Crime After Crime is produced and hosted by Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. And as always, thank you, thank you, thank you so much to all of our patrons. You guys, I absolutely love our Patreon specials that we do. It's a segment we do monthly with them. We go into all sorts of topics. It's awesome over there, so you definitely should check it out. Plus, patrons get a personal shout out and upcoming Patreon specials as well, where we butcher your names, and it's amazing. We just have a great, <laughs> we just have a great time over there. <laughs> yes, we do. If you enjoyed the show, please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help others find us is to tell them tell your friends tell your family that you love crime after crime you guys can also check out our merch store to get a crime after crime mug and be your own winner every month at teespring.com forward slash stores forward slash crime after crime we will see you guys next time on crime after crime stay safe stay healthy see you on may first